Welcome to this week's lecture. And the title is Helping Each Other Out. Subtitle, Living the Deeper Relationship Between Heaven and Earth. Stephen Covey, um, uh, we're going to start, of course, with the uh, modern day uh, issue. And um, so let's go back to Stephen Covey in his best-selling book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, defines the fifth habit as seek first to understand, then to be understood. Now, seeking real understanding affirms the other person and what they have to say. That's what they want. That's what we all want, to be understood, valued, and affirmed. Now, John F. Kennedy, in his inaugural address delivered on January 20 in 1961, he said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. That's what we all want, to be part of a greater whole in which what we give is magnified in that which we will receive in turn. Now, there is no true spirituality, I believe, in which one only seeks to understand the other, but not to be equally understood, and in which one seeks only to do, but not to have done for them as well. As a matter of fact, I will suggest that only doing and giving in a relationship without being willing to receive is maybe the worst form of being passive aggressive in a relationship. Now, let me explain. Because love, caring, and commitment is created in the giving and not in the receiving. Thus, by only understanding the other and giving the other without allowing for the other to understand and to give as well is to only allow for our own feelings in a relationship without allowing for nor making any room for the other's feelings to develop. Thus, in a spiritual relationship, it must be a two-way relationship in which each are both giving and receiving help from each other. This lecture is based primarily on a mimer, a mystical teaching the Rebbe delivered on this Shabbat in 1969, exploring the, the spiritual depth of the verse in Psalms, and I quote, steadfast forever made in truth and uprightness and to understand the depth of this verse according to the interpretation of the holy zohar okay let's jump into the introductions first introduction chaf cheshvan the 20th day of the hebrew calendar month cheshvan while this is not pertinent in understanding the concepts to be discussed here, it will help understand why the Rebbe chose this topic for this Shabbat in 1969. This Shabbat, as in the year in which the Rebbe delivered the Mimer in 1969, on the Jewish calendar is the 20th day of the month of Cheshvan, which is the birthday of Rabbi Shalom Dover of Lubavitch, the fifth Rebbe in the dynasty of Lubavitch, born in the year 5621, which on the Gregorian calendar was November 5th, 1860. Thus, the Rebbe based his mimer in 1969 on the mimer that Rabbi Shalom Dover of Lubavitch delivered on his last physical birthday in the year 5680 which in the gregorian calendar was 1919. now that year the last birthday physical birthday of rab shalom dober lubavitch was his 60th birthday and thus 
Rabbi Shalom Dover of Lubavitch based his mimer in 1919 on the verse of the letter Samach, the Hebrew letter Samach, that has the numerical value of 60 in a chapter of Psalms that runs through the entire Aleph Bet. Now, being that the year in which the Rebbe delivered his mimer, 1969, would be Rabbi Shalom Tov Bear of Lubavitch's 110th birthday. Therefore, the Rebbe connects the concept of his mimer with a verse in Psalms chapter 110 as well. Okay, so now you understand why this topic on this Shabbat, which talks about Avraham. Now, the letter Samach. Let's understand what the letter Samach is. This leads us to our next introduction, which is understanding the physical shape difference of two similar shaped Hebrew letters, the Samach and the final Mem. So there are five letters in the alphabet which have final letters, which means that if you write them in the beginning or in middle of a word, it has one shape. But if you write it as the closing letter of the word, it has another shape. Now, both the letter Samach and the letter final Mem are closed circles, completely closed. Only that the Samach has a roundness all the way around, while the final Mem has a more squarish form. In Kabbalah and Hasidus, the primary difference is that the final Mem has a firm, flat bottom, which allows it to hypothetically settle firmly on a spot, while the Samach doesn't, and therefore cannot hypothetically settle form, firmly on any one spot. So I hope that you'll be able to see this. As always, I will print a link to my notes. You'll be able to type it up. But right there, you have the Hebrew alphabet as it's written in the Torah. On the bottom line, you have the five letters, as I said, which have final letter forms. The top circled letter is a Samach. As you can see, it is completely round. The bottom circled letter is the final Mem. As you can see, it is more squarish with a flat bottom. Okay, so what does this mean to us? So on a Kabbalistic level, both letters being completely circular represents the infinite circular encompassing light. Rather than the finite linear permeating light. Now, within the infinite circular encompassing light itself, there are two categories, the distant encompassing light and the near encompassing light. Now, I want to interrupt myself and just share with you, I'm not going to go through this here, but in my notes, I wrote a footnote, which isn't that much connected with this topic, so I'm not going to discuss it now, but you can read it if you um, download and print the uh, notes. And it, I just discussed a teaching in the Talmud that in the two tablets, which was engraved through and through, the two letters, the circular Samach and the circular final Mem, obviously hung miraculously. Because if you're going to engrave and drill through a stone, through and through a circle, the centerpiece should fall. It shouldn't have what to connect with. I give an interesting insight of my understanding according to this Kabbalistic teaching that these two letters come from the infinite circular light rather than like the other letters which come from the finite linear light. And you can look it up. Let's get back to our topic. Now, so we're talking about within the infinite circular light, there are two categories. There's the mem, final mem, which is the near encompassing light. And then there is the round samach, which is the distant encompassing light. So now that we understand this, let us understand why in Kabbalah, all <clears throat> a, human's need, a human being's primary needs, which is food, clothing and shelter why is it divided in these three categories we'll now understand so food 
is the finite linear permeating light. You eat it, you digest it. Clothing is the near infinite circular encompassing light. And the shelter is the distant infinite circular encompassing light. Now, the difference between the near, which is the clothing, and the distant, which is the shelter, infinite circular encompassing light is very simple. Clothing needs to be made to the size of the individual. It can't be too short and it can't be too long, too big. We'll trip over it. However, shelter, which is the distant encompassing light, you can have a short Napoleon living in a palace, which is hundreds of acres. So what that means to us on a Kabbalistic level is that the near circular encompassing light, even though it is infinite and circular, nevertheless, it has a connection to the size, to the definition and limitations of the individual. While the shelter, which is the distant encompassing light, is completely infinite, not bound in any form or shape with the definitive finite linear makeup. Okay, so let's go ahead and understand that for us, there is the Samach, which is circular, cannot firmly stand, represents the distant encompassing light, and that the final Mem, which has a more flat, statuary, um, stationary, I'm sorry, stationary um, base, that is the near distant encompassing light. Now, now that we understand that, we can understand better this concept of heaven helping the steadfast, the heaven, which is the infinite circular encompassing light, helping us the finite linear permeating light. Okay, so I know this sounds Kabbalistic, but you've been here with me before. It'll all play itself out very clearly. Now, let us talk about the concept of support, right? We spoke about the verse that says steadfast, smuchim, and the word smuchim literally comes from the word samach, which means support. So. Let's go ahead. The word samach actually means support, lismoach. And in understanding what support means, our sages explain us that there are two types of support. One type of support is that the individual, the individual is supported not to fall any lower. That's all. We're supporting it. It shouldn't fall. However, this isn't a support that empowers the individual to be stronger and to climb higher just that it shouldn't fall lower. Now, there is a different type of support, which is called azer, and that means help, that not only is it receiving, the individual receiving the support slash help not to fall any lower, but it is receiving an empowerment to get stronger and to grow higher. Now, what's important to us is to know that the Zohar, the Holy Zohar, on the verse in Psalms, that verse that we quoted in chapter 111, verse 8, steadfast, the Hebrew word there is smuchim, samach, smuchim, forever, made in truth and uprightness. The Zohar points out that in this verse, the opening word smuchim, steadfast, from the root word samach, means azer, help. Azer and not just support. And to understand, obviously the word smuchim from the word samach, when it refers to as help, strengthening, empowering to grow, we're going to connect it with the samach. Samach is the distant, infinite, encompassing light. Okay, another introduction. And this introduction has to do with the spelling issue in the Torah. Okay, so because the Torah is only written in letters without vowels, 
And therefore, nevertheless, tradition was given from God to Moses, to the people of the vowels to the words in the Torah. The Torah, therefore, will sometimes spell a word as full or as lacking. Okay, to understand this, we're going to talk about a specific word in a specific verse that we want to explore. So the word atta, you're familiar with the word atta. It's the second word in a blessing, baruch atta. Atta means you. Now, the letters to the word atta is aleph, tough, hey. Now, however, being that we have the tradition of vowels, so if you put the comets vowel under the tough, you don't need the hey because you will have the word ata without the hey. Put the a vowel under the aleph, the o vowel under the tough, without the hey, it will read ata. And thus sometimes in the Torah, you will find the word ata written aleph, tough, hey, which is masculine for you. And sometimes actually, it will not use the letter hey, and just use the letters Aleph Tuf. Now, interesting enough, Aleph Tuf is also the feminine form of you, only that you don't say Ata, you say At. However, being that the Torah will rely on the tradition given to us in the vowels, the Torah knows that we will know that even though it spells it Aleph Tuf, it is actually the masculine form of ata rather than at. Okay, now at this point, <clears throat> excuse me, at this point, Kabbalah and Hasidus will step in and explain and give deep mystical insight to why the Torah chose here to use the full spelling, Aleph Tuf He, or the lacking spelling, Aleph Tuf. So, what we're going to talk about is the specific verse of Atta in the prophet Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. And I'm going to read to you the verse. You, Atta full, Aleph Tav Hey, you alone are God. The first part of the verse. The second part of the verse. You, over here, we're talking about Aleph Tough without the hay, the lacking form. May the heavens, the heavens of the heavens, and all their hosts, the earth and all that is upon it, the seas and all that is in them. So in this same verse, you have twice the same word ata, only that one time it's written full, aleph tough hay, when we talk about God alone, while in the second Word, half of the verse, when it uses the word ata in the process of creation, over here we're going to see that the Torah uses Aleph Taf, the lacking form. Why? So, let's understand. The deeper meaning according to Kabbalah to the word ata is to break it up. Aleph Taf refers to the 22 Hebrew letters, which starts with the letter Aleph and ends with the letter Tuf. Now, what is this important to us here? Because the verse is talking about God as primordial before creation came about. And there it says, Aleph, Tuf, Hey, Ata, you are alone. However, later in the second part of the verse, where it talks about God creating, over there it says you in the lacking form, only Aleph Tuf missing the He. So, what we need to know is that being that creation was brought about, you know, we'll talk about this in a moment, about creation being brought about through the process of speech. And God said the 22 letters, but let's just understand what the word ata with a hay means and ata without a hay means. So the ata, the aleph tuf, is the 22 letters. The hay, 
represents to what Kabbalah calls the, numer the numerical value of He is five. Thus, it talks about the higher dimensions of the five faces. Now, I want to just share with you that the definition of five faces can relate to three different concepts. There is the concept of the five infinite kindnesses. There is the concept of the five infinite strengths. And then there is the concept of the five faces, which is supernal crown, wisdom, understanding, six male emotions, and feminine mystique, kingship. So it really isn't important right now for anyone to understand what these different opinions of the five, the higher dimensions are. What's important for us to understand right now is that He refers to the five dimensions. And when we talk about God as alone before creation, we talk about Atta with the five higher dimensions. But when we talk about God engaging in the process of creation, we're going to see that there is lacking. We don't have the five higher dimensions. And we will explain all of this. Now, another introduction is, as you remember, I mentioned that the Rebbe, being that he was delivering this mimer in 1969, which would be the physical birth, the, uh, the, the 110th birthday oof, of the uh, of the uh, fifth Lubavitch Rebbe of Shalom Dover Lubavitch, the Rebbe also introduces a verse from chapter 110. 110, yes, it would have been the 110th birthday and therefore 110. Ooh, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's go ahead and understand what's going on here. In the verse that the Rebbe introduces, he quotes from chapter 110 in Psalms verse 4, and I quote to you. God swore and will not repent. Repent means not regret, take it back. You are a priest forever because of the speech of Malki Tzedek. Okay, who is the you? Who is God talking to? You are a priest. So Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, which is the um, 11th century commentary on the Torah. Um, he lived in France, in old France. He gives us two interpretations to this entire chapter. In one interpretation, he says that we're talking about Abraham. This entire chapter 110 of Psalms is talking about Abraham. And he goes on to explain every verse according to that opinion that it talks about Abraham. But then Rashi goes on to say that there is a different interpretation that this chapter in Psalms, the book of David, is actually talking about King David, which is the descendant of Judah. Now, let's quickly go through these two interpretations. Okay, I'm going to break you down this verse, just about this verse, how they will go, how Rashi explains them according to each interpretation. So in the first interpretation, Rashi says, God swore and will not repent. This is God telling Abraham, since Abraham was afraid lest he be punished for the troops that he had killed in the time when he went to war to save his nephew Lot, God tells him, fear not, Abraham. Okay, God will not repent. He's not taken back. And will not repent, Rashi explains, over the good that he, capital H, spoke about you. And then the last part of the verse, you are a priest forever because of the speech of Malki Tzedek. So just that you know, Malki Tzedek in Genesis, this is the offspring of Noah, Shem, and he came to give homage and blessings to Abraham after he won the war against the four mighty kings and saved the five lower kings and amongst them his nephew Lot. Now, he said, Rashi explains, what does this mean when God, the verse says this? From you will emerge the priesthood and the kingship that your children will inherit from Shem, Malki Tzedek, your progenitor, 
the progenitor. The priesthood and the kingship which were given to him because of the speech of Malkitzedek, because of the command of Malkitzedek that said, you are a priest. Okay, first interpretation of this verse. God is talking to Abraham. Now let's go to the second interpretation where we say that God is talking to King David. God has sworn, what that means is that the kingdom will be yours, King David forever. So the Jewish people actually had two kingdoms. There was the Davidic dynasty and there was Malke Yisrael, the king of Israel. When the kingdom separated, the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin was under the Davidic dynasty and the other 10 tribes was under the dynasty of the kings of Israel. Now, the kings of Israel will not have a continuity. When the redemption comes, it will be by Mashiach, who will be a physical offspring of a mother and father, and the father will, have be, will be a direct descendant, son after son, of King David. And thus, the King David, the Davidic dynasty, will be forever. Let's go to the next part of the verse. You are a priest forever. So the question is, and what of the priesthood? What kind of priesthood? So he says, he explains Rashi, a priesthood that is above the priesthood of Malki Tzedek, and that is the kingdom which is above the high priesthood in 30 steps. And the Mishnah talks about the different steps of, of uh, leadership. Now, about the charge of Malki Tzedek, those last words, now, above the priesthood of Malki Tzedek, who was a priest to the Most High God, and then Rashi goes on to say, now, if you challenge that he, Malki Tzedek, too, was a king, he wasn't just a priest, right? He's called Malki Tzedek, the righteous king, Malki Tzedek, and the verse calls him the king of Shilin. So we answer that, Rashi explains, that the kingdom over the nations was not an esteemed kingdom when compared to King David's kingdom over Israel. Okay, so there you go. Now, what we are going to see, why do we need to introduce this entire verse and the two interpretations, whether it's talking about King David or it's talking about Abraham, is because in the mystical teachings of Hasidus, whenever you have two separate interpretations on the same word in the Torah, on the same verse in the Torah, on the same chapter in the Torah, then Hasidus says, dig deeper, and you will see that the two interpretations are two halves of one whole. And thus Hasidus says that in truth what we're saying here is that in order for King David, the offspring of the descendant of Judah, which was the great grandson of Abraham, in order for King David to be able to have his kingship, he's going to need help from Abraham, which is the manifestation of kindness. And thus, in this verse again, we are seeing the same concept of the previous verse, smuchim, support, help, that in order for King David, which represents the kingship, the concept of the linear finite light of kingship in our world, he's going to need smuchim, help, from Abraham, which is the manifestation and embodiment of the God's infinite kindness. Okay, now let's go on here and just say that what we're really going to understand is how this relates to you and I, which is that in order for us to be able to fulfill our mission and purpose on earth, earth represents the finite linear permeating light realm, we need a helping hand from heaven, which represents the infinite circular encompassing light realm. And in return, we bring greater and unprecedented divinity into heaven. Yes, us, the finite mortal beings, actually at the end will be bringing unprecedented greatness and divinity into heaven which will be revealed when Mashiach comes. 
And now we can get to the actual lecture. So as you can probably understand, most, the bulk of what I was going to share and what I'm going to share is actually in the introduction. So we're going to be brief and practical when it comes to now the lecture itself. As you know, I will always begin by listing off for you which mystical concepts we're going to talk about, and then we'll wrap it up with the practicality of relationships, you and I, to God, to our fellow man. Now, the three topics are understanding the process of creation. Number two, understanding the purpose of creation. And number three, the samach, that round letter, the distant encompassing light of Torah study. Okay, let the amazement of Hasidus begin. So, understanding the process of creation. In order to understand why there is the full letters to Atta in the opening phrase of the verse, when it talks about you alone are God, no creation, no process of creation, and then the lacking letters to the Atta, which is only the Aleph and the Toph, in the second phrase of the verse, which talks about God engaging in the process of creation, we are going to need to understand the Kabbalistic teaching to God's creating the universe through the process called Tzimtzum. Tzimtzum means contraction. Okay, Tzimtzum is a process that God, is the process that God used in order to create a finite world. Okay, so just let's understand briefly, and we're going to talk about it over here. So there's the omnipotent God, his infinite light, and God wants to create a finite world. How do you get finite from infinite? The answer, symptom. So let's understand this, okay? And what happens is that God wants to create a finite world gifted with its own identity, as being a separated identity than just a being part and parcel of God's infinite being. Now, why does God want us to have a separate identity? Because through this, we are gifted with freedom of choice. Now, in order to understand this, we're going to have to have a brief and precise Symptom 101 course. So, let's do it. In a book called Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, chapter 3, part 3, I quote, Before the world was created, the Holy One, blessed be He, with His name alone existed. Now, the meaning to this teaching, as explained in Kabbalah and Hasidus, is that the name, it says God and His name. The name refers to the infinite light. I, again, look at my notes, you'll see the footnote of how from infinite from the word name we we get infinite light okay now meaning that before creation there existed nothing and all was filled with god's essence he and his infinite light his name alone nothing else now keeping it only as symptom 101 without getting complicated let's just go through this the essence of God remains filling everywhere. There is no contraction, God forbid, in the essence of God because there's nothing outside of the essence of God. And being that the essence is A, not expressive, it's not about revelation, and B, is all-inclusive, it can, it can have anything and everything within it. Thus, the essence of God is not a hindrance to God's desired outcome of having a finite and separated world with its humans having freedom of choice. So we don't have to, so to speak, remove, contract, conceal the essence of God. However, the infinite light, its presence is a hindrance. For in the revelation of the infinite light, A, there can be no identity of finite, for it will be swallowed up within the infinite light as a candlelight in the presence of the sun and the sunlight, and B, in the presence of the infinite light, in which there is the infinite shine and, revela and revelation that God is everything and everything is God, what would happen is that all of creation would be absolutely transparent to and united with 
and identified only as a piece of God, which would not allow for a finite and separated universe with an identity and freedom of choice of its own. Therefore, God chose to first have a symptom, a contraction, in, with, in which the infinite light would now reverse its shine to sh only shine inwards within the essence and not outward. Thus allowing for what Kabbalah calls, and I quote to you, Makam Panui, a place of void. What does that mean? Not a void of God, but meaning a void of the revelation and shine of the infinite light. And now we move on to Simpsom 102. Again, short and precise. There is a teaching in Kabbalah and Hasidis that teaches us the concept of, and, and this is interesting, that which is only infinite is actually finite, for it is finitely infinite, while only that which is both infinite and finite is truly infinite. The minute you say only, the infinite light is only infinite. You just made it finite. It's only that which can have everything, infinite, finite, that is truly infinite. So, therefore, Kabbalah and, 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 and Hasidus explain to us that in truth, within the infinite light, there exists both. The infinite expression light and the finite expression light. Thus, here we're getting more technical and saying that the contraction was actually in the two levels of the expression light of the infinite light. And in this process, the infinite expression was completely reversed to shine inward into the infinite light. However, there was another part of the contraction in which the finite expression light, which in itself being the finite expression light of the infinite light, was still too powerful to give room for separation, egocentric, self-centeredness, freedom of choice. Thus, God contracted that light as well. Only here, God didn't completely reverse the shine, Rather, God put a shield upon the shine, and thus we now have shining into the makam panui, the place of void, what the Kabbalah calls only a kav vechot, a ray and a thread of light. Now, just to understand that this thread, ray of light, actually, if you want to draw it correctly, you would draw it this way. Where on the top, it's broad and more powerful. And as it evolves downward, it becomes more narrow and weak. And thus, at the end of that finite ray thread of the finite expression light, you now have room to create multiplicity, to create separation, to create darkness to create the capacity and potential of rebellion self-centeredness in a physical realm of darkness where evil truly exists okay so now let us understand what the verse actually means so when we talk about atta you alone are god not the process of creation but the way God stands in the, quoting the Pirkei de Rebleza, he and his name alone, over there you had Ata with the hay. The five faces, the revelation was all there. However, when we talk about the process of creation, to create a finite world that can actually experience egocentric, self-centeredness, rebellion, and darkness, and evil, you have to first make the contraction. And thus, in that part of the verse, it says, Ata without the hay, the lacking. Because here, there was a contraction and a lacking of any revelation of the higher five faces. So, therefore, we now understand 
the concept of the full atta, which includes the hay of the five faces and the process of creation demanded to take away, to hide that hay, the, high, the five faces, so that we can have a finite, and in that finite itself, only a ray and thread, and in that ray and thread itself, to evolve into weaker, 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 and weaker, until there is room for darkness. Okay. Now that we understand the process of creation according to Kabbalah, in which there is an atta with a hay, but then for the process of creation, we have to have the tzimtzum and have the atta without the hay. Now let's understand the purpose of creation and specifically such a creation which can lead to darkness, self-centeredness, egocentric evil. Okay, so we're also going to understand through this why Abraham has to help King David and why the verse tells us that we have to have the support of the Samach, the distant encompassing light of the Samach in our verse, which says, Smuchim, steady fast, support, forever made in truth and uprightness. Okay, to understand this, we're again, we're going to need to understand the purpose of creation. What did God want? when he created a world specifically in which we are left driven to a self-centeredness, selfishness, and godliness. Now, the answer explained in Hasidus is based on a teaching in a Medrish Tanchuma. Medrish Tanchuma is a, uh, a Medrish, a homiletical teachings on the Torah. Now, the, over there, and I quote to you, it says as follows, it's on the portion of Nasa in the book of Numbers, chapter 7, verse 1. And it says as follows, The purpose for which this world was created is that the Holy One, blessed be He, desired to have an abode in the lower realms. So there you go. The purpose and mission of life is very simple. To create for God an abode in the lower realms. Okay, now... Not in my notes, but simply to understand this. There's a verse in, in Psalms, which is part of the Hallel, which says, Hashomayim shomayim la Hashem, heaven are the heavens for God, the Haaretz natan levne Adam. But the earth was given to mankind. So, at the onset, what we have here is that this world is not the abode of God. And God's presence upon this world this physical world, was pushed away, starting with the sin of Adam and Eve, continuing on with the sin of Cain against Abel. And therefore, God, so to speak, the teaching tells us, we kept on pushing away Ragli Hashchina, the feet of God's presence in our world. And now we're left with a world where we have to create from it with freedom of choice, and transform the jungle into a garden, into an abode for God. Okay, so let's see what's going on here. Rav Shneir Zalman of Liadi, the Alter Rebbe, founder of Chabad Lubavitch, in his founding works called The Tanya, in chapter 36, he quotes this teaching of Medrash Tanchuma and sets it as a fundamental concept through which a myriad of speech of spiritual concepts in Kabbalah about the process of creation and the deeper meaning of behind Torah and mitzvot are understood. This, found, this founding concept as exp, is expanded upon in the greatest length, width, and depth in the teachings of all the succeeding rabbeim of Lubavitch. All seven Rebbes of Lubavitch keep on drilling, explaining, defining, extrapolating, and, and every detail of this one concept, that God created a world of freedom of choice and separation so that we would transform it because he desired, God doesn't need anything, but God desired to have this environment become his primary residence. Okay, let us so explore now dira betachtonim. Those words mean an abode in the lower worlds. 
Let's explore, let's now explore Dira Betachtonim 101. Again, keeping it short and precise. The focus of this teaching is that the abode for God will not only be in the lower world as a statement of geographic location, but also that this physical abode will be, and I'm going to borrow from Abraham Lincoln, of the people, by the people, for the people. Meaning that God did not desire to have the symptom process through which God hides his revelation in order to create separation, identity, and freedom of choice, to then just have a hostile spiritual takeover from heaven onto earth, in which spirituality and revelation will impose itself upon the physical, overriding and denying the finite form, perception, and psyche of the darkness of the physical. That is not what God wants. So in summary, the entire purpose of symptom removing the hay from the Atta, you, alone are God, in order to have the contraction, the Atta, you, lacking form, made the heavens, etc., in creating the world is that we should then specifically we of the people, by the people, for the people, go on to bring the hay into our world. And through this, make our world the ultimate abode for God, drawing the infinite circular encompassing light, and as we'll soon see, even the essence of God, into our world, into the realm of practical and physical revelation. And that's what the messianic era is all about. Now, however, to do this, we must first have the help from heaven, the Samach, distant, encompassing light revelation, in order to empower us finite mortal beings to be able to draw the great five faces, the heart, the hay, and the essence of God into our world through Torah study and mitzvot observance. We need to be empowered. We are physical, finite, mortal beings. How can we influence and draw infinite, and not only infinite, but even the five higher faces, and even higher than that, the essence of God? How can I have any impact in drawing them into the world? Yes, I study Torah. Yes, I do mitzvot. But my Torah study is finite, and my and physical and human and egocentric, and my doing mitzvahs aren't all that selfless. Thus, we first need a helping hand, and that helping hand is the samach, the distant, the distant encompassing light which can tolerate, which can tolerate everything, for it is truly infinite, and thus it can also empower me, you, finite, moral, egocentric, driven people to be able to connect with the infinite light and even higher than that, the essence. Now, because through the physical study of Torah and the physical observance of mitzvot, we create the rebound light. What does rebound light mean? What it means is that normally in Kabbalah, light will always come from above to below. However, when the sunlight hits the earth, for example, it rebounds, which, by the way, is the physical reason why the lowest, the lowest hemisphere, the, the lowest atmosphere is actually warmer than when you go up to the middle atmosphere. Why? The middle atmosphere is closer to the sun. What's the logic that this world down here, the lowest atmosphere, should be warmer? And the answer is, scientifically, it's because the sunlight hits the ground and rebounds, thus we get a double whammy, a double empowerment of sunlight. On a spiritual level, when we talk about the rebound light, we're talking about from below to above. We're talking about the light created through our Torah study and our, we're talking about divinity light, spiritual light, through Torah study and mitzvot observance. 
Now the power of the rebound light, being that it reaches into the depth of the will of God and the pleasure of God within the essence of God, it is far greater than the direct light of the infinite light, which comes from above to below. And therefore, it is through our working down here that we introduce and evoke the revelation of the essence of God, something which even the direct infinite light doesn't have. And thus, in this part, it is us helping heaven. Heaven is only its experience of the infinite light. Down here, where we have the physical Torah and the physical mitzvot, the rebound light, which reaches into and fulfills the will of God, the pleasure of God within the essence of God, we connect to that which even the infinite light doesn't have. And thus by the infinite light helping us to do this in return, it receives help from us in unprecedented revelation of the essence. Now, with that being said, we understand now how it works. Avraham helps King David, which in turn brings unprecedented greatness to Avraham. The Samach, the distant encompassing light, helps Smuchim, helps us to be able to be spiritual human beings, performing spiritual Torah study and mitzvot, acts of goodness and kindness. And in return, we bring it unprecedented experiences of the essence of God. Okay, next topic. The Samach of the Torah. So you will recall that I shared with you that God's desire to have an abode in the lower realm isn't just a de geographical spot, but rather it is a form. God wants the abode not to be coming from above to below, but everything should be, as I quoted from Abraham Lincoln, of the people, by the people, for the people. Thus, even, this is an amazing step here in this process, even the help from above needs to be evoked by us below so that even the help of the above is part and parcel of God's desire and pleasure of having it of the people, by the people, for the people. How do we do that? How do we evoke on our own the help of heaven? the help of the Samach, the distant, encompassing light. And the answer is that God gave us the Torah. And in the Torah, there is a part, a category of the Torah, which is the Samach light of the Torah. And that is what we call the hidden Torah. So in the Torah, we have what we call the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. We have what we call the soul and the body. We have the, the, um, the uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the regular, um, the linear light and the Samach circular light, the revealed Torah and the hidden Torah. Now, when we talk about the Talmudic study, the process of defining every exact physical detail of the parameters of a commandment, that is the body of the Torah. That is the revealed Torah. That is the, that is the, I'm sorry, that is the, uh, the linear light of the Torah. I don't know why I'm getting stuck here. However, when we talk about the Hasidic teaching, we talk about the mystical, that is called the soul of Torah, the tree of life. That is called the Samach of Torah. Thus, by us studying the Samach of Torah, not just the Talmudic understanding, but the mystical hidden soul of Torah, 
That empowers us. It connects us to the Samach revelation. It brings us to higher intellect, higher life, higher consciousness, in which it truly opens our eyes to see in our day-to-day -day practical life that everything is God and God is everything. Thus, by studying the Hasidus of Torah, we are evoking the Samach, distant, infinite, circular, encompassing light to empower us to then transform this world into an abode for God. And the ultimate abode is not the abode for any revelations of his light, but for he himself. And thus when Mashiach comes, the verse in the prophet tells us, and our eyes will see our teacher, meaning the essence of God. So in closing, as in light of all of the above, we can see that creation is all about a two-way communication between God and us, heaven and earth, in which we are given the opportunity to be both the giver and the receiver, the helper and the helped. And this dialogue of communication in a relationship is what defines our genetic genetics and purpose. It's got to be a dialogue, not a monologue of a relationship. Therefore, in each and every relationship that we have, we must always ask ourselves, one, am I in this relationship both a giver and a receiver, a helper and a helped? Two, do I allow for the other in this relationship to be both a giver and a receiver? a helper, and a help. Have a wonderful day, and may you experience only beautiful relationships with God, with your inner child, with your spouse, with your children, with your greater family, and with everyone and everything around you.